Hello, I'm First Alert Meteorologist Steve Sosna. Thank you for joining us for an important CBS News Baltimore streaming special, Warming Signs. We assembled a team to investigate how climate change and rising sea levels are affecting weather and the water that surrounds our state. And we've uncovered new exclusive data that shows the potential risks we all could experience. Maryland is rich with shoreline and coastline, and it's an area that could have devastating consequences due to climate change. Our E-Team, committed to telling environmental stories that impact your daily life, traveled the state to show you how rising sea levels are impacting our resorts, farms, neighborhoods, and cities. Let's go to our own Paul Gessler, who is in Ocean City and leading our coverage. Paul. Maryland has nearly 3,200 miles of shoreline, much of that low-lying coastal land like its summer getaway of Ocean City. But with its beauty comes the risk of rising seas and changing landscapes. It's a windy November day on the ocean. Normally, like a nice day would be 11 to 13 miles per hour, yeah. so this is a front that's coming through. Kim Atplanalp is a lifetime resident of this coast. These guys have already fed this morning and now they're just chilling. The birds sunbathe as Ocean City shines, even in its slow season. The town is completely built up. It's a big party scene in the summer. In the summer, this town of 8,000 full-time residents becomes one of the state's largest cities. It attracts 8 million visitors each year. There's a long history of tourism down here. People bringing their children down here who have a week or two at the beach and get exposed to a, an environment that they're not used to where they live otherwise. A beach and environment at risk from rising seas and a warming climate. This is happening all around the United States, particularly on these coastlines that are really vulnerable. And we're one of them. We're already at sea level. Sea levels and shorelines are always changing. Not since the, the last deglaciation of the end of the glacial period, you know, the uh, the ice age, if you will. Dr. Donald Bosch is the president emeritus of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. We can't stop sea level rise because the ice is starting to melt, but we can we can limit its growth. Bosch wrote this year's sea level rise projections for the state. It details if we don't limit global emissions, Ocean City's existence is in jeopardy. It's not a question 200 years from now, it's a question 70 or 80 years from now. Bosch's best case scenario by 2050, Ocean City's seas will rise by a foot. We are very much facing in the coming decades something that we as a modern civilization have not experienced before. Dr. Erica Lentz is a researcher with the U.S. Geological Survey. In the next 30 years, we're expecting to see a century's worth of sea level rise increase. In exclusive data analyzed by WJZ, it shows Ocean City's iconic beachfront and much of its waterfront property is likely to change in the next decade. Well, that's pretty scary for me because this is where I, where I call home and I am actually buying a condo on Friday. <laughs> Scott Houston has lived here since the 80s. He and Kim are seeing the effects of rising sea levels play out during storms and more frequent flooding, though they say some might not be connecting the dots just yet. Some people are in denial about it or they thinking that it's not that bad or it hasn't affected them yet. It's happening so slow now that people don't really notice it because it's just a little bit a year, just a little tiny bit. And I think it's going to take a big event where lots of people are impacted for anybody to really put it on their radar. More severe storms and more frequent flooding led the state's Department of Natural Resources to create a community-driven reporting system called My Coast Maryland. It allows you and I to report flooding and storm damage, as was the case here on 3rd Street in Ocean City in September. Or a week later, a few blocks away, with tidal flooding overtaking an intersection here at 5th and Edgewater. Researchers say nature has a way of showing us how shorelines want to change. We just have to listen. Storms, and particularly the flooding from storms, gives you a snapshot of where the shoreline wants to go. Changing shorelines are likely, and they will be costly. This has enormous economic consequences, loss of agricultural lands, loss of the infrastructure we have along along shorelines, 
the need to, you know, to bolster those. All of those are tremendously costly. WJZ reveals at least $1.2 billion worth of property in Worcester County has a higher chance of changing compared to surrounding areas over the next decade due to hazards along the coast, including rising sea levels and erosion. Well, it's pretty terrifying, especially for some of these property owners. Because they're more heavily developed than ever. Um, and so, you know, you get those big numbers from um, assessments like this. Scientists say dredging projects that continue to replenish Ocean City's iconic beachfront are only hitting a pause button on a fast forward crisis. Is that sustainable? I mean, how many years can we just keep pumping sand and keep these buildings from being put underwater? What's, what's the lowest lying land here? The beaches. So those coastal beaches and barrier islands are an immediate threat. In Ocean City, as we know, it won't be here really what the bottom line is. There's no stopping water. It really depends on us. It depends on how much uh, we emit greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, methane. The beach ball is in our court, preparing for coastal change in a warming world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's shocking, but I mean, it's predictable because we are warming. Like this was the hottest year on record for the planet. And that's not sustainable. Things are gonna melt, sea level's gonna rise. We continue our special traveling up the bay with a trip to Somerset County. Dennis Valera introduces us to an eastern shore farmer dealing with the effects of saltwater intrusion. We also hear from a scientist taking soil samples, what those samples reveal about how rising seas affect the land we rely on for food. We have a soybean stubble there. The Fitzgerald family has been farming in Somerset County for centuries. When I was growing up, we raised a lot of truck crops, tomatoes and cucumbers and string beans and that type of thing. But these days, the crop is a lot different. If I don't do that anymore, nobody around here does it anymore, really. Because the land is different. This part is also worthless. Basically, basically. it's been damaged so much, it's, you can't do much with it. Fitzgerald says these dead patches are becoming more common due to how salty the land is getting. In this spot specifically, a creek has been flooding it with salt water. What he can grow dwindles season by season. They'll come up and die. You know, if you plant beans or corn or wh whatever you plant there, the salt just kills it. Fitzgerald has tried several, sometimes expensive methods to keep the water out or neutralize the salt, but the problem has not slowed down. Salt water continues to flow into his land. It's frustrating, but it's reality. WJZ looked into just how much saltwater intrusion has impacted Somerset County. Our data analysis shows the number of impacted plots has increased nearly 30% in recent years. That's a total land value of more than $97 million. To see what's happening on Bob Fitzgerald's land, you can head to what is now called the Deal Island Wildlife Management Area. Coming here now, you can see just expansive marshlands. But many, many years ago, a community was here. That community was called Bethel. According to a map WJZ found dating 1903, 21 homes used to be in that area. 22.5 millisiemens, which is about what we see at marsh water. At another section of Fitzgerald's land, University of Maryland scientists are measuring just how salty it's getting. This is uh, as salty as we might see in some of the tidal creeks. Yeah, absolutely. And it's here at farm. At it's farm. next to a farm. <laughs> They've been sampling Fitzgerald's land for years, testing the water and the soil. It's all in the ribs. With these tools, soil samples are taken at different depths. We gave them a hand on this trip. So you see, you're going to push to there. Yep, exactly. Dr. Kate Tully is an associate professor of agroecology. Oh my gosh, and it was like a perfect <laughs> core. She describes saltwater intrusion as a silent flood because we don't know the full extent of the damage. It's really only been in the last five or six years that a lot of scientists have started to focus on the impacts on agricultural land. Dr. Tully co-authored a study looking at the spread and cost of this. The study tracked these, salt patches. A big warning sign land is becoming saturated with salt. What it found, between 2011 and 2017, the amount of visible salt patches almost doubled, with more than 20,000 acres of farmlands converting to salty marshlands in the Delmarva region. An estimated loss of between 39.4 million to $107.5 million annually. Sure, you can say, you know, th this many acres might equate to this many millions of dollars, but that legacy is something that you can't put a dollar value on. Part of Dr. Tully's research is finding solutions, particularly how farmers can keep farming, testing out salt tolerant crops, plants that can actually suck out salt, even exploring creating a strip of marsh in farmlands, which Dr. Tully says has some benefits. That can be met with some resistance, 
which is understandable if you're a farmer and this is your property and you've been farming it or your family has been farming it for hundreds of years. At first <laughs> glance, that's like counterintuitive. As Dr. Tully continues her research, farmers like Fitzgerald are part of the process. We kind of leave it up to the farmer or the landowner to make the decision about whether that's something that they want to implement on their land. As they continue to figure out how to navigate using their land, getting saturated with salt. As far as losing land to seed over eyes, give up, give it up. It ain't, you know, that's the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. In Somerset County, I'm Dennis Valera for WJZ. You can't tell the story of rising sea levels without also having a conversation about environmental justice, specifically those communities disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. In Baltimore City, a multi-year, multi-million dollar project is now underway to address flooding in some of those communities. Jessica Albert reports from along the Patapsco River on the Reimagine Middle Branch project and introduces us to several residents who want to put an end to repeated flooding. The plastic lid. At the Middle Branch Marina, Marty Petrelli goes fishing. I find a lot of these kind of cigarillo, cigar wrappers. But fish aren't the only thing she's after. She also fishes out trash. This is a just an old bucket I found and a few bottles that I pulled out this morning. She lives at the marina part-time on her boat. And while she's here, she makes sure things stay clean using makeshift tools. They're old crab nets. I use them to fish trash or skim trash out of the top of the water when the tides come in. This isn't the only part of the middle branch with trash. About a mile south of the marina at the mouth of the Patapsco River, we found even more. As you walk through here, you can see that there's tons of trash in this area. Why is that? Well, the water floods regularly along the middle branch. And every time it comes up, it sweeps a whole raft of trash and debris up onto the shoreline. This is called sunny day flooding. Some call it nuisance flooding or even king tide flooding, a phenomenon that causes flooding even without rain. A century of data analyzed by WJZ found areas along the harbor are seeing more sunny day flooding than ever before, which is why Marty is seeing more trash. You know, I used to do it just when the storms came in or when I saw trash, but I'm starting to notice more and more trash. So it's getting to be almost like a daily part of my routine. Trash isn't the only concern for those living along the river. WJZ mapped communities living in flood zones along the Patapsco River. We found thousands of homes and businesses along its shorelines are impacted by nuisance flooding. Photos from a website called Maryland My Coast show some of the damage. Nuisance flooding is not when a storm comes in and blows a bunch of water onto the land, but it's when the normal cycle of tides produces these huge tides that begin to inundate the soil, and that gets worse and worse as the sea level grows. Brad Rogers is the executive director of the South Baltimore Gateway Partnership. An organization that receives $8 million a year in casino revenues, and our job is to improve the neighborhoods of South Baltimore. Over the years, he's seen the damage done by nuisance since flooding and how it's eroding South Baltimore shores. As flooding gets worse, you have a neighborhood that's getting more and more isolated, more and more vulnerable over time. That's why now is the time to take action. His organization is partnering with the Reimagine Middle Branch Project, a community-led initiative to reconnect South Baltimore to the 11 plus miles of shoreline along the Patapsco River. A portion of the project is to invest $30 million into rebuilding miles of wetlands and and landscaping destroyed by rising sea levels. It's going to help improve our protection against flooding and it's going to help keep trash and debris out there instead of up here where we have to live with it. Reimagine Middle Branch will not only protect the coastline, but will also bring amenities to the areas along the Patapsco, making it a place South Baltimoreans can enjoy. This is a beautiful waterfront, but it's Baltimore's forgotten waterfront, and we're working to transform it into Baltimore's next great waterfront. Work to restore the wetlands will begin next year and should be done by the summer of 2025. Jessica Albert for WJZ. Next up, a focus on our state's most precious natural resource and the largest estuary in the country, the Chesapeake Bay. We look at the role oysters play not only in water quality, but in shoreline protection. Caroline Forback reports from Dorchester County. Rising sea levels are swallowing our shorelines, uprooting trees and cutting off land as more of our coast crumbles into the bay. 
And this was all filled in with, with uh, grasses. There's a few left. Dorchester County is losing an average of one foot of shoreline per year. That fell in maybe about five years ago, but this was all land. For those who live on the outer islands, the effects of erosion and rising sea levels are getting closer to home. This was St. John's Creek on Taylor's Island in 2005. This is what it looks like now. now we've had a lot of erosion. Our land was right there. <laughs> where those revetments are. Revetments, breakwaters, and riprap's have all been used to combat erosion. But scientists at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science are researching a more advanced and sustainable approach. So this is an oyster castle you can see. Matthew Gray is an assistant uh, professor at Horn Point Laboratory in Cambridge. And as those oysters grow, they cement that structure together and then you can deploy these blocks and these structures in a way that uh, buffer shorelines. So this is a, like a piece of yeah, the yeah. oyster castle? I guess I'll hold it, yeah. Whoa, <laughs> that's pretty heavy. Yeah, so this is, this is an oyster castle and you can see how they can kind of fit together. The oysters latch on to the hollow cement blocks, creating a man-made reef. As the sea level rises, <laughs> Um, those oysters can grow and fill in that space. The idea is that they will act as a speed bump, weakening the waves as they lap against the shoreline. We use a variety of sensors to measure how these structures actually dampen waves. Stone or cement breakwaters break down over time. But oyster castles are a living, breathing fortress that repairs itself. Figuring out how to build with the oysters and integrate them could not only prolong the effectiveness of that infrastructure after sea level rise kind of manifests itself, but also can it immediately improve the habitat of that, all that gray infrastructure. Gray infrastructure is the man-made concrete or steel barriers that are used to prevent shoreline erosion. It makes up roughly 1,000 miles of the Bay's coastline. Matthew took us for a ride to get a closer look. Literally like a shadow of itself. All you see is the structure, but it's not breaking any waves. If anything, it's increasing wave height. He says oyster castles would reinforce the existing gray infrastructure and help absorb the impact of the waves. So these things are really living and adapting with the environment. That's why we want to build with nature. If the environment changes, you've got to change your design. Oyster castles work best in an environment where the oysters can thrive. Scientists at Horn Point Laboratory are experimenting where that sweet spot is. They all need research. Every, every substrate's different, and we need to understand how and when we can use them. The easiest place to, to deploy these right now is a salty bay that has a warm winter. Protecting Maryland's roughly 3,200 miles of coastline will take time. But most projects are small in scale. You can't have rinky-dink projects. You have to have massive reefs that can fortify submarine bases and uh, other things like that. As the threat of erosion creeps up on the people who live in Dorchester County, oyster castles could be their first line of defense. A sustainable solution really needs to incorporate building with nature. It really should be able to resist um, climate change, sea level rise, and adapt to changing environmental conditions. In Cambridge, Caroline Forback for WJZ. And that concludes our field coverage for this special. For links to the sea level rise reports, USGS tools, and MyCoast Maryland reporting data, head on over to CBSBaltimore.com. For now, I'm Paul Gessler reporting in Ocean City. Back to Steve Sosna on TV Hill. Thank you, Paul. And you can be certain that WJZ and our E-Team will bring you the latest news as it pertains to rising sea levels and climate change. Together, we can be better informed and more prepared when weather impacts our area. Plus, you know you can always count on our WJZ First Alert weather team to keep you updated. It's our goal to provide you with solutions and information to protect our state and yourselves. For the entire E-Team and WJZ First Alert weather team, I'm meteorologist Steve Sosson. Thanks for watching.